Um, in our workbook, we're on page, uh, let's say 73. <clears throat> um, we just, in the Bible, we've just gotten about, uh, well, we've gotten most of the way through chapter 2. <clears throat> and we were seeing that most of what Job was dealing with was outward affliction, outward things. This is all things that come externally. They're things that we have to deal with externally. Um, and we've noticed up to this point that Job has had no inward affliction, meaning reactions to the outward afflictions. However, that's all about the change. But at this point, the last words that he said was, Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And um, uh, and he's, he has been under these trials, but he's not seeking deliverance. Now, I don't care what you say up to this point. If Job had have immediately sought deliverance, he would have missed what God had for him. Okay. He would have got deliverance, and he would have thought, that's, that's it. That's what this is all about. That's why God exists, to deliver me from my problems. But he would have missed the eternal plan of God. He would have missed something more dear you know, than, than you could ever explain. So, in that sense, um, he's done well. <clears throat> but then, verse 11, Job chapter 2, verse 11. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Tiamite, and Bildad the Shuite, and Zophar the Naamathite, uh, for they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. <clears throat> And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they tore every one his mantle and sprinkled dust upon their head together uh, toward heaven. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spoke a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. <clears throat> All right. Now I will tell you, that a lot of times when someone is going through great grief, it's almost wise not to say anything unless the Lord gives you something. If the Lord gives you something, praise God. But they will appreciate you a lot more <laughs> if you just be there with them and for them. Um, Cassie was talking about that at their little get-together we had for them the other night. She was mentioning Susan Dolan and that at... at uh, Deb's father's death, Cassie was greatly affected and sat there during and after the funeral was over, couldn't move and just sat there. And different people came up and tried to encourage her and say things and pretty much didn't help. And uh, Susan just came over and just sat with her for a long period of time. And that's what Cassie alluded to. Well, I've seen that over and over. Um, usually Christians... As, as Christians, we feel it's our job to go, you know, get anybody if they're down or sad or hurting or whatever. We want, it's our job to go get them up. That's usually the idea. We want to get them up, you know. And um, I, don't, I don't really see that in the Bible that that's our job, you know. Our job is to give them the Lord, and the Lord can be given without words. You know, who was it? Um, St. Francis of Assisi said, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. <laughs> you know, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to use words. Um, and so these three friends have shown up and they're um, in the midst of sitting there sort of staring at him for seven days. But you have to realize now, this is, 
they're looking at Job. They're looking at his, his house, his farm, ranch, whatever you want to call it, everything that he owned, gone. Everything that he's lived for, everything that he's worked for, decimated. And he is sitting there in great pain. And these three guys, and they'll say stuff like this, but these three guys who are great men in themselves sort of sat under and looked up to Job, that Job was really something, and he was the pinnacle of what the way it should be. And now all of this disaster and and I think they, their intentions were good or initially that was to, to grieve with him. But before it's over with, man, they, they're like vultures picking bones, you know. So uh, well, here they are. And, you know, you got to remember, too, that this guy, Job, he was the greatest man, you know, in the East. That's what it says. The greatest man in the East. And uh, now he doesn't look so good. Um, they, his friends come, and he's been humbled, and he's been brought to nothing, and they're looking at him and um, sitting right in front of him. And uh, now it's kind of like they used to look up to him, and now they're looking down at him. They used to look up to him, and now they're looking down at him. And, uh, and in, in every sense of the way most religious people are, they uh, appear like they're above him. <clears throat> All right. These are just words. Uh, you can't imagine what it's like to uh, give your whole life to the Lord, to do everything you know to do to order your family in the Lord, to... Um, to see the blessing of God and to know. I mean, one of the things Deb and I said when we got married is we said, we're, we're going to, whatever our home is, we're going to decorate it with the ornaments of a story of the Lord's love or provision, something like that. And so the Lord would do something that we, you know, instead of going out and just getting it, well, let's just go get it. We would trust the Lord, you know. I mean, if we had the money, we weren't afraid to buy it, but I'm just saying we would we would trust the Lord, and so the Lord would provide miraculous. And this is sound dumb, but this was one one example. Uh, our girls were very little, and, and um, that particular year, that particular Christmas, we were not doing well financially, and... Um, we, I don't know where we'd been, but we were out, and we were coming back through Denton. To, yeah, anyway, we were driving along through there, and Naftali, our oldest, who was, I don't know, very young, very, very young, uh, she said, Daddy, I really wish that we could get a Christmas tree this year. And I said, I said, we just, sweetheart, we just cannot afford a Christmas tree. Um, and she said, well, I prayed and I asked the Lord to give us a Christmas tree. And that's life's always been great at, you know, when no one else would think to pray, she would always think to pray, always. And so, so we quit talking about that and we're just driving down in silence. And, and there's, it's getting pretty late because it was dark and there was nobody hardly on the road. So I don't remember where we we're coming from. But anyway, we're on I-35 and we look up and the headlights hit a Christmas tree in the middle of the road. <laughs> And we'd pull over real quick and six foot five. Six foot. Yeah. And we'd pull over and there's no cars coming and we'd pull it out of the road and we're going, Where is everybody? No, 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 no. We stuff it in our car and drive home. We set it up and we just went and she's going, Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and the other, the other two are going, Oh, God is good, you know. Um but but um and so, so we have, would have, we have things over the years. You know how it is, over the years. And we like the fact that we could almost point at anything at the house and go, let me tell you a story how the Lord provided or the Lord's grace or, you know, over and over, something like that. Well, 
I think in Job's life, maybe that was the situation that God had provided and provided wonderfully. And now um, he's in this state, and to his understanding, he doesn't know why that that things you know shouldn't have gone this way. And so with these guys looking at him, something rises that didn't rise before. What was it? Pride, self-righteousness. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not, you know, you're looking at me like I've done something wrong or I'm not of God or all this kind of stuff. And I tell you what, man, when you live for God, it's important to you to be of God. And it's important to you that, let's put it this way, it's important that your testimony shine forth the Lord. I don't know how important that is to God, and I'll, you know, we'll get into that. But to, but to you, especially if you're maintaining your integrity, it's real important. And so when this whole situation starts looking like what it does, man, pride rises and self-righteousness, and you just, man, it's just not, not pretty. And that's where we get into chapter 3. We almost could read this whole chapter. <clears throat> so after this, open Job his mouth. All right, so he hadn't said anything hardly at all except good stuff up to this time, right? After this, Job had opened mouth and cursed his day. And Job spoke and said, Let the day perish in which I was born, and the night in which I, I was said, There is a male child conceived. Let that day be darkness. Let not God re regard it from above, neither let the light shine upon it. Let darkness and the shadow of death stain it. Let a cloud dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, let darkness seize upon it. Let it not be joined into the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Lo, let, let that night be solitary. Let no joyful voice come in it, meaning be better if I wasn't born. Uh, let them curse it that curse the day who are ready to raise up their morning. Let the stars in its twilight be dark. Let it, it look for light, but have none. Neither let it see the dawning of the day. All right, so, um, well, that's one, because it, it shut not up the, uh, the doors of my mother's womb, nor hid sorrow from mine eyes. Why died I not from the womb? Why did I not expire when I came out of my mother's body? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breast that I should suck? For now should I have lain still and been quiet. I should have slept. Then had I been at rest. All right, so <clears throat> let's just consider some of those thoughts. The first thing to consider is that you remember Ben was talking uh, last Sunday uh, about in, in Kings and about how Elijah had gone against the all the prophets of Baal, and uh, he was he was one man that stood for God, and all these guys worshipped this this false gods, these idols, and and so uh, Elijah stood against it, and he prevailed, and and the the idol worshipers were defeated, but then he was told that uh, Jezebel was going to come and kill him, and he ran 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 and went to a, a far place and everything, and he fell down before God, I think underneath a juniper tree, and he said, you know, I wish I'd never been born. And you hear that. I think Moses said that also. You hear that from some of the greatest men in the Bible. And you go, what is up with these guys, you know? I mean, uh, and, and, and uh, Job will get into it even more later. But <clears throat> though this may be hard to believe, <clears throat> There can come a time when you either wish you were never born or you wish God would just take you then. And 
And it would be a favor to you from the Lord if he did. He just stopped the whole train right there. It's like, just let's just stop. Let's just do this. And the thought of carrying on for, depending on how old you are, of carrying on for any number of years past that um, would almost be nightmarish, even though you're of God and you love God. But it's like you are brought to an end of yourself so deeply that death looks pretty good. Not necessarily suicide. We're not talking necessarily. You know, but we're saying death looks pretty good. <clears throat> um, and it would certainly get you out of all the mess that whatever. Um, Job is also addressing another fact. He's putting it all the way back to his birth, and he's doing that for a reason. He's, he's, he's saying that basically I have lived my whole life for God, and this is how it ends. What's the point? Okay? Y'all following this? What's the point? And don't tell me that you, if you... Uh, if you have kids and you're raising your kids and, and, you get, and you do everything you know to do to raise them right and to put Jesus into them and you, you, you know, Job, man, he'd offer, remember, he would offer burnt offerings for his kids continually and he's, do, he's just trying to do it right in every way and they end up, you know, doing any number of things that you can name. You know, the girl gets pregnant or the or the kid gets into drugs and you know starts dealing drugs and you know you know you can, you, you know messing up other people and stuff and you just go what is the point of this why was i even born this is bad it would have been better if i never was born than than it turned out like this and in that is also the thought, I thought that by doing it right, everything's going to turn out right. Anybody know that thought, you know? That by doing it right, everything's going to turn out right. And, you know, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't always do that. I was thinking about David. What a great man of God. I mean, a man after God's heart. Um, and the, the relationship he had with God. But he was, you know, it appears that he wasn't a very good father because none of his kids turned out right. They all wanted to kill him and overthrow him and stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's like, kids, I love you. I raised you. Why are you all trying to kill me and overthrow me and take my position? <clears throat> Um, but you have to remember that it's not always after the flesh. That David sowed a lot of good seed into a lot of people. I guess you could say he's still sowing good seed into people. Maybe, you know what I mean? That he's, he's got some wonderful children. Spiritually. Some wonderful children. And... Uh, so we, but we would think, and we would look at David, and I mean, you, you know, I love, I love this uh, interchange between the historical books that are telling the stories of David's life and then Solomon and all this, but like with David, you also have the Psalms, and you can match up Psalms to different parts of his life, and it's so cool because the, the, the historical thing is just telling you the story but the psalm is telling him what, what he was going through or how he dealt with it. It's really cool. And there's a lot of the psalms that have that will tell you this was written during this time. And you match it up and you go, oh, my God, how precious, you know. So you see that. I mean, you see it over and over and over. And I'm, we're just using him as an example. You see someone that put the Lord first and that did it at the expense of his own you could say his own kingdom because he was promised that kingdom and never got it until halfway through his life. Um, 
And then he had to fight his sons for it. <laughs> um, but there is this thought in Christians' minds that this thing's not by grace. Oh, no, no, we'd never think that. No, no. What we think is that if I do everything right, everything's going to turn out right. And it's very disappointing when you find out that that's not really how everything works. Especially, especially if God has his hand on you to conform you to the image of Christ. I can tell you absolutely that that's, that's not necessarily it. And so... Um, you know, and so we think by doing everything right or doing everything good, it keeps bad from happening. And that is just not the truth. Okay? Because why? Because there's more to it than just uh, reaping what you sow. So all good, and you'll get nothing but good. You don't ever have to suffer if you just sow everything good. Then there'll be no suffering. Well, if that was the only principle there is, yeah. You know, what about the sufferings of Christ? Well, I don't want none of that. And that's Christianity right there, or at least a bunch of people. I don't want that. I don't want suffering. Well, I don't want, you know what? I don't want suffering either. I want Christ. And that that's, talks about to be a, to fellowship in his sufferings is to be with him where he's at in his crucified nature. And so, you know what? I don't want sufferings, but I want the Lord. And if I have to, if I have to go through suffering or be with him in his sufferings, bless God, I'm going to do it because I, he's worth it. You know, it's not about me. I don't, well, I don't want to suffer. I, you know, and I, you know, obviously you know that I, I get flack all the time because I suggest that, Maybe, <laughs> you know, we might have to suffer some. And, and again, I'm, I don't advocate suffering because I like it. I'm not looking forward to it. I don't, I don't want suffering in and of itself. I'm just like you. But I want Christ. And sometimes, and you know, what does it say? Um, uh, he that, what is it say? He that followeth the kingdom will suffer, something like that. Um, and, and you see it with, you know, as soon as the church begins, there's trouble. You know? I mean, Jesus isn't even cold in the grave, and Pilate is telling them, you know, when they find out that his body's gone, they say, well, say that, the, say that his disciples came and stole him away. Okay. So this is like they figured out before the sun comes up because he's going to show up. All they've noticed is the body's not there. And there's this rumor. Let's spread a, a rumor that he didn't really rise from the dead, that really this is just some sneaky plan by these Christian guys to fake us out and they're deceivers and everything. And so as the sun dawns toward the new day, it's Easter Sunday morning and the new, the, 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 the new dew is on the grass and, and birds are singing and now it's resurrection morning. How clean and pristine. Hey, did you hear? He didn't really rise from the dead. Uh, really, these guys that uh, they work together and uh, they stole his body and they're trying to make us think, you know, and they're going, hey, man, I don't want to hear that. Stop dirty and everything that's so clean and everything. From the very beginning, you would think you'd have one clean moment. I'm telling you, you just read the book of Acts in light of that. No, I'm serious. I'm dead serious. You will just go, every time it looks like it's going to be really pure, the devil through men or whatever pollutes everything, and your purity better be in the pure reality of Christ, not looking for the pure moment or the, 
you know, like I said, the, the pristine resurrection morning. And, you know, I mean, I, see, I was raised to revel in that because I was raised in the United Methodist Church. And guess what the United Methodist Church does, or has you do? Easter Sunday morning, sunrise service. Every Easter, sunrise service. Okay, so you're there, and, you know, you're, we're outside and we're all in chairs and we're waiting for the sun to come up. And the sun comes up, glory, or, you know, up from the grave he rose with the mighty triumph for his foes. Well, not really. They're spreading rumors that this didn't really happen. And a lot of people are believing it. <laughs> so, you know, what are we looking for? I'll tell you what we're looking for. We're looking for a God that would have, you know, made Pilate, when he started to say it, go, <laughs> you know. Well, he's not Darth Vader. He's God. And he's... And... He lets whatever roll, roll. The people that can be influenced by that rumor are going to go with that rumor. Can I get amen? amen. The, the ones that, if they're already that way, you say, well, let's save them from hearing it. You might save them from hearing it, but eventually there's something that's going to trip them up because they already have the stumbling block in themselves. Do you, I mean, do we not realize that? And the ones that are open are going to hear it and go, you know what, I don't care if this whole city of Jerusalem believes that lie. I know he's alive and he's alive in me and glory to God. And you look around, you know, I mean, the, the, Peter and them ended up in Rome. You go, what? See, they've gone all the way to Rome. No, they're in the catacombs, in the tombs, <laughs> worshiping God, hiding and going, you know, you talk about underground believers. They are underground, and they're in those catacombs worshiping and honoring God, and they're not going, well, we should, we should have the Vatican. This isn't right. You know, you know I'm in mean, the Vatican. wasn't even there yet, but I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make a point. You know, we should have the big buildings, you know, the worship buildings or whatever. no. We should be with the Lord wherever we are, no matter what. And we should be with the Lord regardless of what's flying around us in terms of rumors and lies and things that make you look bad or make them look bad or, you know, to, to pollute, to pollute, you know. I mean, we, we talk about air pollution. We talk about, you know, global warming. Oh, Oh, God, there's air pollution, and it's going to make the earth stinky, and it's going to, you know, really mess everything up, folks. I, I, I shouldn't say it. It's a randyism, and it would blow you away if I did. But, but we're, we're sitting there polluting the spiritual world. And we're filling people's ears with junk and lies because we believe it. We go, it's got to be true because I heard it from, you know, Jochebed. And Jochebed would know, man, he saw two guys sneak in there and steal his body. And we got proof. Those guys are a cult or whatever, whatever. You know, it really doesn't matter. What matters is do you know, do you have the true God? Do you? And if you do, say what you will. Draw in as many followers that, will, that are already tuned to follow rumors and lies because they're already tuned to it. You know what I mean? They're already that way, you know. And we think, again, we think, well, we can, we can remedy this by, you know, explaining to people. You know, you can't explain away someone's bent towards not Jesus or anti-Christ, you know. Because, you know, I've said this before, but the devil, you know, the devil and all of his followers, I mean, their whole deal, you don't, you know, 
the, uh, the whole Satan worshiping thing is a farce. You know that? You know, people go, oh, there's Satan worshipers and all this stuff. Not too many. There's not, you know, don't you, th there's a mosque in this town, but we don't have a church of Satan here. Do you know where there is one? Could you take me? Let's just, you know, you know, let's go pray for them. They're not around. You know why? Because the whole spirit of that thing is not pro-Satan. It's anti-Christ. That's why they, they can't get together and go, hey, let's worship Satan. Nah, let's go pick on Jesus. Yeah, I mean, really, I mean, it sounds funny, but that's the spirit of the thing. I mean, that's why they can't get together and build churches. You'd think they had as much time as Jesus had and more. You know, <laughs> you know there ought at least be, you know, one in each state or something. I don't know, but you just don't, you don't hear about it. But you hear about people talking about it in church. They're, oh, well, the church of Satan, they, yeah, well, who are they? Where are they? You know, but Antichrist is in people in churches. Well, I don't, I want, I want to be saved, but I don't want Christ to be my life. That's Antichrist, you know, and I don't, you know, you know, people can take that and run with it and give them another excuse to kill me. But nonetheless, it's the truth. It is not pro-Satan. It is a spirit that is, and it's not anti-Christian, folks. You say, I don't know how them Baptists or whatever, you know, some denomination, I don't know how they've been going for all these many years. They got nothing. Well, they, they, they don't have, I'm going to say it like this, and I should, probably shouldn't say anything anymore. But they're not preaching Christ. So the enemy is not going to mess with them. They can last for a billion years. The devil goes, yeah, keep going, you know. I'm not saying, I mentioned Baptists. I, I love Baptists, and they believe in salvation, and they're my brothers. But I'm saying some denominations we would look at and go, how does that keep going when they just have no substance to anything, and it just keeps, it doesn't fall apart? How is that? Well, the enemy won't hit that because... The, the enemy is anti-Christ, not anti-Christian. He goes, oh, y'all keep going. I'm going to go over here and mess with, you know, I'm going to go mess with John or Robert or somebody, you know, Mike. And so we, we, we experience all kind of things that come our way because we love Jesus, because we won't back off from Jesus, because because Jesus is more precious to us than anything else, and it just infuriates the devil and his followers. Oh, what do you mean? You can't, be, you know. <laughs> All right, maybe I got some notes here, and I'll get on to something sane. All right, so uh, Eliphaz uh, in chapter four, he's the first one that speaks, and. He he really is, is good. His first go-round is uh, basically you reap what you sow. Okay. Now, again, it is, there's truth in you reap what you sow. Amen? But that is not the only truth there is to life. It is not the only explanation of troubles and trials. Okay? So... Eliphaz is looking at Job. Now remember, you get, you got to kind of look at Eliphaz and look past him and look into his brain, and you see this this fluorescent green ticker tape that runs in there, and in that brain it says, "You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow." So while he's looking at Job, he's looking at Job with all these boils and everything else, and he's looking at everything bombed out and blasted and stolen and everything else. And you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. So he's looking at all that. And, and Job is going to, to respond to him, look, I am of God. I, I, am, I have been following God. I have not sinned. I have not been secret. You know, and he said, I have not sinned. And, of course, you know, it comes back, well, then you have secret sins. Because 
You reap what you sow. 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 Okay? And so when Job says, look, I'm of God. I've been with the Lord. I'm, I've been following the Lord. It says, you reap what you sow. You're faking your relationship with God. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. You're faking your relationship with God. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Okay? Because it has to, do you understand that if some, that's somebody's one claim to fame on what they believe is an explanation for people going through something, then pretty soon, you know, it comes to, and this, and Eliphaz will basically almost get to it, you're a liar. You're a liar. Look at this situation here. You're a liar. But remember this. God said, have you considered my servant Job, who is perfect and upright? Now, either God's a liar. You following that? Either God's lying or Eliphaz has it wrong. Okay? All right. So, he, there's so much good stuff here, but, well, let's look in chapter 4. This is Eliphaz speaking. Let's look in verse, start at verse 3. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upheld him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it has come upon thee. And thou faintest, it toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Um, is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and thy uprightness of thy ways? Uh, remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? Okay. You get what he's saying? Yeah. He's going, look, you know, you were, you blessed, and you did all this great stuff for people, but now you're in trouble, and, and they were in, they, they were in trouble because they messed up, but you were so benevolent, but guess what? Now you messed up, and he says, but isn't all this good stuff that you did for other people, isn't that um, thy, uh, verse 6, isn't that thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, the uprightness of thy ways, the reason why you've been this way? But remember this, nobody innocent ever suffered. Well, we're going to find Jesus in all of this because the innocent did suffer. Um, verse 7, remember, I pray thee, who, whoever perished being innocent or where were the righteous cut off, even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. There's your, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. You see that? Uh, by the blast of God they perish and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed. The roaring lion, he's talking about Job now. The roaring lion, meaning what he was before. The roaring lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken. The old lion, Job, perisheth for lack of prey and the stout lion, his whelps, his children, are scattered abroad. So basically, he's saying, look, you were strong, you were like a lion and all this stuff, but you were you were out of whack with God and God is bigger than you and he's hit you with all this stuff. All right. So uh, in the next part, verse 12 on down, he starts, uh, Eliphaz starts telling about this dream that he has. And it's like this demonic spirit comes to him and it tells him something. And from that, he's, you know, you almost have to read the thing. I hate to read this whole thing, though, but um, uh, verse 13, In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, and the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its form. An image was before mine eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? 
Behold, he put no trust in his servants, talking about the angels. He put no trust in his servants uh, and his angels he charged with folly because they fell, right? How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay, that's us, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before the moth. So he's saying, God, this, this demonic spirit came to me and told me that, you know, God doesn't trust you. You're not trustworthy, you know. Job responds later and he goes, why do you, why do you put, try to bring me to fear with these dreams that you're having? I mean, it's, this, is, this is like a nightmare to Job because he sees different than them, but he doesn't see as God sees yet. That's the key. And at the end, you have to remember, God rebukes these friends and says, you were wrong and Job's going to pray for you. You remember that? You were wrong and Job's going to pray for you. But he says, Job, you were right up to a point. And then he, you know, shows the whole story. All right. So, all right. So what Eliphaz will do, because they, they have several rounds of this. There's three of them, three talk. And then, and in between Job talks, three rounds again. They all get turns, you know. And uh, Eliphaz, the first one, must be the oldest probably because he spoke first, and that's the way it was back in, in uh, the East in those times. Um, he uses a lot of his experiences, okay? It's, you know, I experience God in this way. I experience, well, I don't have any problem with experiences, folks, but let me just make it plain. What you get doesn't come from experiences. It comes by revelation from the heart of God. God reveals his son. Yes. Okay. Then you experience it. But, if you, but it's not the experience that did it. It is the revelation of God, the revelation of Christ being revealed to you. And so, so uh, and what, what am I saying basically? I'm not saying that experiences aren't good or whatever, or we can't refer to them or stuff like that. But Eliphaz preached his experiences. And Eliphaz and Randy and you have not experienced everything there is to experience. And even if you had, and if you had no revelation, you wouldn't know anything. But revelation is the word unveiling. It's the same word, unveiling. <clears throat> and God must reveal his heart and his ways because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. And we can experience God but not experience him by revelation. And we still don't know. And, and I tell you what, I mean, I'm doing a thing on my newsletter about the God that hides himself that I've been doing for a couple of months now, and I will go at least through September on this thing. But it is, it is about the reality that God has something in his heart concerning who he is, that he has, you can use the tabernacle, he has kept behind a veil the whole time, waiting for us to know by unveiling what it is that that God is like. And so, <clears throat> anyway, we'll stop here and we'll uh, come back next, next Thursday.